from first and um, most generally, there are um, simply three steps in the research process. The first is to pose some kind of question that's of interest to you, uh, collect some data that will answer that question and then present the answer to that question to an audience who is concerned to find the answer to the question that you researched. I will be re referring often to this slide that gives you a broad overview of all the steps in the research process. Everything from identifying the research problem, uh, reviewing the literature related to that topic, um, specifying a purpose for the research effort, uh, collecting data, analyzing and interpreting that data, and then reporting and evaluating the research. Um, that first step, identifying the research problem, involves first uh, discovering some issue or problem that needs to be solved. Obviously, there are a lot of issues in the world that are worthy of interest or that are, are interesting and uh, worthy of some consideration, but the important first step is for the researcher to identify for him or herself what that issue is and why it needs to be solved. Um, uh, when we go ahead and start writing uh, your paper, you need to state this up uh, up front so that the person who is might be interested knows right from the beginning uh, what the problem is and why you are interested in studying about it, studying it. So for us right now in this class, it's important at the very beginning to start thinking about that topic and what it is that you'll be studying for the rest of this semester. Uh, the next step is to conduct a literature review. And literature review basically uh, helps you dis uh, discover what has been studied about this problem before and what do the people who've studied it think. And this is a, a crucial first step in the process for an individual to become literally immersed in the literature of that particular topic of interest to them. Uh, this does a couple things. One, it gives you a broad view of what has been uh, thought about this topic, but also uh, exposes you to not only the solutions that some people have come up to that problem, but also helps you look at a situation with greater clarity. If you have a better idea of what other people thought, there might be some things that you never even considered before that when you finally do see what other people have thought about it, uh, opens up a, a whole new level of perspective and insight into the issue that you're uh, talking about in the situation in which you work. Uh, what are the sources for um, for our lit review? Well, you can find um, a summary statements and books, but most of all, you find the answers or you find the information for these in journals and index publications. Uh, we often call these peer-reviewed journal articles, and here's where most of the information resides. Um, when we write the literature review, what you do is you don't cite everything that you've read, but you selectively choose the literature that you're going to include, and you summarize that literature in a written in a written document. So in this case, you summarize it in the lit review section of your research project. Uh, the next step is to then um, state the purpose for doing this particular research. Once you've done the lit review, you may discover, ah, you know, really there's no more need for a study. The study has already been conducted. Um, I'm just going to use what already is out there to address the problem that I face. Or you may find there's a gap in the information, and that's really what you need to do, is you need to be able to find out what is missing and fill that missing intellectual hole or apply it in a unique situation that... Um, that you face, and that's what you're saying is you intend to um, you intend to uh, you state what you intend to do with the findings once you've discovered them. Next thing you do is you collect the data, uh, you identify uh, individuals for a study. This is often called uh, um, uh, sampling the population group, the individuals from the entire population that you wish to single out for study or to talk to. Um, about gaining more information. You obtain uh, permission <clears throat> from the site that you're working and from the individuals that you're going to be working with. And then oftentimes you gather that information by asking questions or, or observing behavior. The next step is to analyze and interpret that data. This is where you draw conclusions from whatever data that you've drawn. And then you represent that um, finding in charts or graphs if you're doing a quantitative analysis, um, pictures other kinds of descriptions if you're doing qualitative, and then you've explained what you found. 
the next step is to go ahead and report this information. Um, you decide on the audience. You structure the report, structure the report for for their viewing. Uh, you present the report and then you submit it to to some uh, some standard evaluation. This could be a self standard that you look at and you say, you know, did I meet all the criteria? Did um, or you can submit it to a, a, an independent body. We call this the peer review process, where you actually go ahead and have others who are experts in the field make a judgment about the quality of your work. Now there are basic two, basically two different kinds of um, of research that that we conduct in educational research: quantitative and qualitative approaches. The quantitative approach is for the number folks where you convert your observations into some kind of data to be able to manipulate in some way, a t-test or an ANOVA, a correlation or a regression, some way to reduce the observations into a number. The second way is to do uh, of conducting research is to do a qualitative study, which is um, basically where you go about doing interviews and or observations. Uh, you don't reduce things to number, but you organize and find uh, themes common to the people that you are interviewing or the um, situations that you observe and you present it in some form of a narrative. A little more about quantitative research methodology. Basically, it's the approach of um, scientific method to the uh, to the social sciences, the method, same methods that you would use in a lab, we're going to be using in the lab of personal experience. Um, it has somewhat of a modernistic philosophical foundation. By that it means, by that we mean that the world is orderly and understandable, and that we can perform tests on it, and from those tests understand something about um, about reality, especially in terms of predicting what is or what can happen in the future. And um, just as atoms and molecules are subject to predictable laws and axioms, so is human behavior, also subject to similar kinds of laws that we can understand and use to predict what is going to happen in the future. So people who believe in quantitative research methodology believe that the world is objective and reality is understandable. Standing somewhat on the other side of that are the Oh, I'm sorry. Um, the the emphasis of quantitative research is collecting information and and re and um, reducing it to some kind of uh, of a of a number or some kind of object expression of it. And so we collect scores and we measure attributes, and then we take those numbers and attributes and then we compare either group to group or um, factor to factor, variable to variable. So we want to find the relationship between the groups of numbers on one side and the groups of numbers on the other side. So we uh, assume in quantitative research that the future can predict uh, can be predicted by the past, uh, that people are part of the natural order of things, and we have we can our behavior can be understood, and uh, from that we can uh, make assumptions about how people act. And uh, one of the most controversial parts of quantitative research methodology is that behavior is normally distributed. That means that you can find an average, an average person, and um, know that there are people that will be above average and people that will be below average, and that there could be a, a norm that you could use to predict generally what um, a group of people will be able to do. The qualitative research methodologist is more of a postmodernist philosophical foundation um, and believes that ultimately that knowledge is personally constructed. You construct a view of the world that is different than anybody else who constructs that view of the world. And through that view of the world, you look at your world and surroundings. You have a lens, you have a bias that is inescapable. And because of that, there is no such thing as a um, as, as a uh, objective reality that can be understood by all people equally. In this methodology, the researcher is more passive. They need to listen to the view of the participants, get their story, get their perspective of things. We need to ask these kind of questions of people that we interview and let them talk, not bias their response or frame their response too much in advance and that we go into the reporting of our research uh, with an understanding that we have bias.
and that that bias will um, will affect how we how we view things. It will affect how we report things. And if as long as we're up front, we're okay because we're not pretending that things will be otherwise. A qualitative research assumes that life is not neat and orderly. As I mentioned, there's no such thing as objectivity, although we can try to be as objective as we as we can, but we won't ultimately be able to achieve that. And that at once we uh, have come to terms with our own understanding, we've uh, constructed reality for ourselves, then we submit our views to a larger body. And then as a group, we, we construct our understanding of a field and what I add to it is, um, is, is necessary, but also what's necessary is what others would add to it as well. Uh, finally, for this brief introduction, we're going to talk, um, again, somewhat um, brief, briefly about ethics, the important parts of the research process, involves all the things that you would just intuitively think. Uh, we need to be honest about what we find and what we discover and what we report. We need to understand that we have biases, but be as objective as we can. We need to do the work. Um, we need, if we're going to interview, we interview enough people. We make sure those interviews last as long as they need to last. If we do a survey, we need to do it honestly and not try and bias the responses. We need to be careful and conscientious in what we do. Uh, if we find what other people think and say, we need to reference that and we report other people's observations. We're not going to steal other people's ideas. Uh, we need to be confidential uh, in what we... Um, what we find out, um, sometimes we can discover things that could get somebody in trouble. So when we report things, we need to make sure that we protect people's confidentiality and guard that to make sure that we don't report things that could lead to serious repercussions for other folks. Um, and we need to have respect for other human beings and the processes that we're putting them through. Um, I've listed uh, two, um, uh, two videos on... Um, and we, that we play in class, and you can access either one of those through YouTube. One's the Milgram's of, of the Milgram Obedience Experiment. The other is the Stanford Prisoner Studies. I'd suggest that you go on YouTube and Google either or search for either of those, and take the ten or fifteen minutes necessary to watch one or the other. And basically, what it does is shows what happens when researchers are.